and welcome to the second day of HistFest 2021. My name is Rebecca Adil and I'm the director of HistFest and I am so excited to share with you today's events. We have a fantastic assortment of talks and discussions so please do check out everything else that's going on via the website which is www.histfest.org. Before we get started, on behalf of HistFest and the British Library, I'd like to acknowledge the passing of His Royal Highness the Duke of Edinburgh and pay tribute to his long public service. Now, just a couple of pieces of housekeeping before we get on with the first talk. Um, using the menu above, you can provide feedback on the event and also, if you wish, donate to the British Library. The Library is a charity um, and your support really does help to open up a world of knowledge and inspiration to everyone. Your feedback is also incredibly important in helping to plan future library events. You can also find a tab at the top with a link to the library's bookshop where you can browse a range of titles by all of the festival's authors and speakers. Without further ado, I am truly delighted to introduce our first event of the day, The Real World of Arthur Conan Doyle. Panellists on this event include the best-selling author of Victoria and Abdul and the mystery of the Parsi lawyer, Shrabani Basu, and historian and award-winning author of late Victorian crime fiction in the shadow of Sherlock, Dr Claire Clark. The event is chaired by BBC broadcaster, historian and author of Inventing the Victorians, Dr Matthew Sweet. Enjoy. <laughs> Hi, my name is Matthew Sweet and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this HistFest event. And on this one, we're going to be looking at the consequences of two crimes and use them as a way of looking into the culture in which they took place. Now, one of those crimes was uh, a crime of passion, a murder that rocked late Victorian England uh, to its foundations, as they say. A horrible murder committed by a frustrated middle-aged Scotsman who'd grown tired oh so very tired of being dominated by a man called Sherlock Holmes. And you know what he did. He pushed him off a massive waterfall in 1893 and then resurrected him in 1903. And just as a, as a mark of respect to him, I could, I could put this on for the rest of this introduction. And it's also the year of our second crime, 1903, all crimes, a series of animal mutilations in the countryside around Birmingham of which a man called George Adalji is accused and convicted. But the perp from our first crime, the literary one, is in a way the detective in this case. Mm. And the investigation is as one that's as much to do with institutional racism as it is into who put the knife into Staffordshire livestock. Well, on the case, we have uh, Shrabani Basu, whose books include Victoria and Abdul, and I find it very easy to imagine her new one, about the Adalji case, the mystery of the Parsi lawyer, ending up on the big screen too. And with her own case book comes Claire Clark, assistant professor of English at Trinity College, Dublin, Ireland. Her first book, Late Victorian Crime Fiction in the Shadows, Sherlock, was awarded the HRF Keating Prize in 2015. Um, now, our purpose today is to use Doyle's life and, and his writings to try and say something about culture of his moment. And I think perhaps this is the this is our first very chewy bit because we've all got that history of, of Holmes adaptations in our heads to negotiate. We've got the rather odd publishing history of these of these narratives and their relationship to the time in which they were written. So um, uh, Shrabani, I think to ask um, what is Sherlock Holmes's historical moment is quite a tricky question. It is. I think there's there's two uh, there's a part one and a part two. Of course, there's the first book, you know, the birth of Sherlock Holmes, the introduction to him, and then, as you said, you know, there's the murder because he's thrown off, <laughs> mm -hmm. and uh, but you know, nobody is prepared to accept that Holmes is dead. Uh, clerks in the city of London wear these black armbands to mourn for him. This is a fictional character, but he has sort of entered everybody's lives. And um, so, you know, he has to bring him back. And I think that's part two. I think that is the crucial moment when you have to, you actually kill somebody, but the author 
has begun to hate his own creation and he's tired of him, but he's killed him off. But now he's got to bring him back because, you know, he's popular, he's money, he's everything, you know. So uh, part two, and I think this is the crucial moment, is when he's when he comes back to life. I think it is so Holmesian the way he comes back in, in this, uh, you know, when he recreates him. So I think that is that is the crucial moment. <laughs> but how do we sort out, Claire, what the, you know, what the contemporary world of Sherlock Holmes is, because these short stories are the ones written in the 19th century. They're, they're sort of contemporaneous with their moment of production. Then we get ones that are set in the in the past that we're reading at the very, very beginning of the 20th century. When Holmes comes back, does he come back to the Edwardian period or, you know, where are we in, in time? All of this is so, his timeline is extremely complicated. Absolutely. It's an incredibly complicated timeline, as you say, and one that you would have difficulty, I think, trying to plot out when exactly was Holmes alive, when was he dead, when was he working? We have Watson kind of uh, throwing various dates around at various times and sometimes making a mistake, which adds mm. to the complexity. Um, but yeah, I think that... Um, when, especially after Doyle had resurrected Holmes, we had we had entered the kind of post-Victorian age at that stage. Queen Victoria was dead, but it was a there was a sense of nostalgia. I think he was he was looking back to that moment in the 1890s when Sherlock really rose to prominence and was famous. And there was a nostalgia for that moment that he wanted to recreate in those later stories, which is part of the reason why they were then set back in time again. So Shrabani, for that audience in mm -hmm. 1903, which is kind of the, the year of your story that we're going to talk about, and also the year that, that Holmes kind of returns as a, as, a, as a recurring character who we can expect to stick around for a bit. Do you think that his readership in that moment regard him as a figure of the present day or as one of the of the recent past? I think it's recent past because by 1903, we have the first, uh, not the resurrection, but the last famous book. I mean, his most famous book, uh, The Hound of the Baskerville has been published. And uh, Conan Doyle actually sets it very carefully, predates the Re Reichenbach Fall. So he, he, he makes it very clear that this happened before. And it's, uh, so he set the timeline in that, in that phase. So people, I think, are still in very much in the late Victorian period. That is how they relate to Holmes. And um, so he is going to set it, you know, the rest of it is this little model, but he's going to more or less do late Victorian. Let's reflect a bit on what has happened between his death and, and resurrection, Claire. This is really your your, uh, your area of specialism. Tell us a bit about all the detectives who came in to fill that vacuum once uh, <laughs> Doyle had decided to, to throw his hero into a great column of Austrian spume. <laughs> well, yeah, as you say, Doyle was plotting Sher Sherlock's demise really quite soon after he started to be successful. And, his mother persuaded him to hold off a little while, but after he visited the Reckenbach Falls with his wife, he decided that that was the tomb for Sherlock. And um, he wasn't too worried about Sherlock. You know, he said, you know, I, I don't care about killing him, even if I do bury my bank balance along with him. But the editors of The Strand were extremely concerned about this. They were basically losing their cash. This is the magazine from. that all these stories had appeared in up to that point. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. This was this was the magazine where Sherlock was appearing monthly. Um, and they were extremely worried about how they would fill that void. And other magazines like The Strand, there were a number of competitors which probably weren't doing as well as The Strand, were rubbing their hands together and thinking, well, perhaps we can get another Sherlock for our own magazine. So the Strand magazine filled the void with a couple of writers, uh, Grant Allen um, and uh, Elizabeth Thomasine and Mead, who is an Irish writer. But really, they didn't exactly have the same kind of Je ne sais quoi, the, the sketch in a couple of those interests, you know, maybe they didn't, you know, they didn't get as big, but just give us a little sketch of who those people were, what kinds of, what kinds of subs are coming in onto his path. Okay, so there's um, Arthur Morrison's um, Martin Hewitt would be one of the first replacements for, for Holmes, and um, he 
it could be identified by a series of opposites. So Holmes is tall and thin, uh, Hewitt is short and fat, Holmes is a, a genius, Hewitt is an everyman. Um, Holmes works by kind of mysterious processes. Hewitt explains everything. Mm. So authors were keen to kind of replicate Sherlock, but also add some kind of a twist to it. Um, in the case of Martin Hewitt, Arthur Morrison's detective, he did it by sort of doing all of these opposites, but it ended up really being quite boring. One of the other things that people did was create female detectives. Mm. Um, and they were able to detect in different kinds of ways. So there were various kinds of twists that were put on this. Supernatural detectives would be another one where they, you know, Sherlock inv uh, only investigated very material things, but they would investigate uh, crimes that were involving the spirit world. So, so we've, we've sort of said, I think, that when Holmes comes back in the, the run of stories that we know as the return of of Sherlock Holmes, that it is something that harks back to um, the late 19th century. But, but Shrabani, can we detect how the world has changed uh, between mm -hmm. these two great strokes of stories? If you were looking in those uh, stories, the ones that are contemporaneous with the case that you've written about, where can we see something, ideas that are distinctly Edwardian? Well, you know, Queen Victoria is gone. This is the, you know, she symbolized empire. <laughs> So for me, you know, I have written on Queen Victoria as well. Uh, and for me, the, her death, 1901, marks this big turning point. It's actually the beginning of the end of the empire. <laughs> so things are happening. Uh, there is a big change. Edward, um, Edward VII, it's quite symbolic because the first thing he does as soon as he takes power within hours is to destroy the letters of mm. his, that his mother has written to uh, you know, her trusted confidant, Abdul Karim, he, and he sends him packing, sends him back to Agra, sends all the Indians away. So suddenly there is a change. Um, there's a change in the palace, no more curries, no more turbans, no more, no more color. Mm. Um, it's a colder place in a sense. Um, and at the same time in India, things are happening. Um, historically, this is also a time of rising nationalism. Uh, in India, the revolutionary movement, especially in Bengal, are picking up pace. Um, I think as soon as, you know, the death of Victoria marks a, a big change in India as well. Uh, though the biggest memorial to Queen Victoria is in, um, is in Calcutta, is the Victoria Memorial, uh, and it was subscribed to by ordinary people, there is in Calcutta, in Bengal itself, a revolutionary movement growing in the early 20th century. And Curzon has the partition of Bengal to actually, uh, on religious lines, Hindu and Muslim, to actually curtail this revolution. So things are stirring in mm. India. Um, things are happening in you know, the biggest empire, this jewel in the crown, there is a movement. Edward has um, sent Abdul packing. So there is a change of mood. I think mm. You know, all the things that were happening in Victorian England are slowly changing. So I think that is quite important. And this is the time that trouble is also beginning um, in Idalji's, in George Idalji's life. And yeah. I find that quite significant. Yeah. But look, before we move on to George Idalji, let's, let's just try, I, I just want to know a bit more, Claire, about where all of the processes, all of those shifts that, uh, that we've just heard described might be showing up in, in Doyle's fiction. I mean, are there, are there ideas from this later period that is, is he more, is he attuned to the idea of a, of a crisis of, of empire? The idea of degeneration pops up more in this period of Doyle's writing, doesn't it, than it, than it does in the previous one. How is he more, how is he attuned to the ideas of his moment in that, in, in the stories of the return? Doyle is an incredibly, complicated figure when it comes to his views on empire and I think we can see that in the Sherlock stories where there are a number of stories where people visit the imperial outposts and become in some way tainted by them. They, like Colonel Kurtz in Heart of Darkness, go native to some extent mm. and bring that uh, badness or madness back to the imperial center. So that's a very common trope in uh, Doyle's writing in his Sherlock Holmes stories. 
And Doyle, I think as well, has a great sense of himself as a public intellectual and a yeah. public writer. And is writing um, to newspapers constantly about the Congo, the Boer War, all of these kinds of events. He wants to insert himself into the public discourse. Um, uh, home rule as well, of course, in Ireland was something where he famously changed his mind about that. So he's he's engaging with all of these kind of debates about the, the kind of dwindling of empire coming into the early 20th century. And I suppose also fiction has, fiction has changed so much, hasn't it, since he began these stories? He started in the world, really, of the, of the three-decker novel, uh, didn't he? And, and yet by the time he's out of it, I mean, you just mentioned Joseph Conrad, the whole atmosphere, the whole tone of, of, of uh, English literature has changed, the, the processes of production has changed. Claire, it's a, it's a transformed environment. It is, yeah. I would like you say that the triple decker novel was kind of dying by the 1890s. The 1890s was a perfect moment for short stories. And I think that short stories in magazines is part of the reason for Sherlock's enormous success in that period. But by the time we get to Hound of the Baskervilles and later on, the short story is dying off, or certainly the popular short story is dying off and is about to be replaced with modernism. The, the, you know, the concerns of modernism are, are, coming, are starting to creep in as we move towards the First World War. And that kind of adventure boy's own fiction that, that Doyle enjoyed and wrote is starting to feel somewhat anachronistic, I think. Okay. And, and Shrabani, what, what is Doyle's role in the culture? Uh, at this point. Claire's mentioned that he was an inveterate letter writer. I mean, his, okay. his letters to the press are a, a rather chunky part of his collected works, aren't they? You can go through that and find find stuff on everything from his pro proposal for a channel tunnel, I think, <laughs> and all sorts of military and imperial ideas. What what do you make of, of what his uh, what his relationship is with the with the rest of culture at that point? Well, it's also interesting, you know, just to take up on this trail of uh, Doyle and Empire. Uh, his writing, his nonfiction writings, uh, he writes about the Boer War. And that was a major turning point because the Boer War was seen as something that was, you know, people were really critical of Britain's role in it. Uh, they were critical of these concentration camps that were set up. Uh, Lloyd George and others were all, you know, all the liberal politicians, liberal writers were all very critical. But here comes uh, Conan Doyle and he, he travels there. And he comes to the defense. So it is defense of empire as well in this, you know, where he justifies what happened. And as a doctor, when he says that these were not concentration camps, this is actually the disease spreading, he actually makes the Boer War, uh, he turns the chapter in the thinking of the Boer War, and he is knighted for it. So here we see him as uh, being very part of the establishment, part of uh, writing these, you know, this big volume book that he writes, I think it was about 60,000 words or something. It was a bestseller, sold everywhere, translated as well, went to France, went to the continent. So he became Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. He didn't want to accept uh, the title. He didn't want a knighthood, but his mother persuaded him and said, no, it would be insulting the king if he didn't. So he had to take it. So here we see, uh, you know, the other door, which, who is very much part of of the establishment, part, you know, believes in empire, believes, of course, in this concept of very benevolent empire, but he is, he is very much part of it <laughs> and, and ready, where, to, ready to stick up for it, as he does with the book on the Boer War. It's interesting that he should be there and like John Buchan, who in a way, in many ways, is one of his successors, is also kind of wound up in this, I mean, very literally part of that, uh, uh, of that camp system, isn't he? Sort of doing its PR, uh, yeah, isn't he, yeah. I think. Um, exactly, but yeah. uh, but what is going, I mean, people I think will know if they know anything about Doyle's life will, will perhaps see it as something in a series of, of, of stages. Are we yet at the phase where he's interested in spiritualism and, and fairies and, uh, and moving beyond the veil? Or is he in some different position um, intellectually at this point, Shravani? I think he, he's always been interested in spiritualism. Uh, but this, I think it increases and he finds his calling. It, that's after the First World War, when he's losing family. Uh, but the interest, you know, the Victorian sciences, the, um, 
this, uh, you know, this need to reach out to the dead, uh, that there is the spiritualism, there is this other world. He was fascinated by Buddhism. He, he thought about reincarnation. You know, all these things were going on in his mind at a very early stage when he was writing essays uh, before he'd even written uh, the Sherlock Holmes books. Uh, but um, I think he made it his calling and sort of identified himself with it much later in life. And that is after the First World War, when family are lost. And he, he just, uh, you know, he just, he has a shrine to them and he just wants to appeal, you know, just, just try to reach them. And uh, he is ridiculed for it. You know, people say this, this, this was the man of science, but he takes it on. Uh, he is quite committed. Professor Challenger met the fairies, didn't he? And he went to Atlantis and did the, went to these places that Sherlock Holmes, I, I feel kind of couldn't go. But, but Claire, these ideas do seep into the stories, uh, don't they? We get, we get um, even if there's a, a kind of rational explanation, the Hound of the Baskervilles takes us into that kind of territory. Uh, and, and perhaps, you know, perhaps it's there in those short stories too, a, a taste for the more outre or outlandish. Yeah, absolutely. And, I, you know, the use of the word outre there, I think reminds us of, you know, he was a huge fan of poem. So, um, uh, yes, he likes in the Sherlock Holmes, I think, to play with the suggestion of the supernatural, but it's usually disavowed. But at the same time, he was writing incredible gothic short stories where he was fully exploring these ideas. You know, so a lot of the same ideas to do with empire and so on with uh, haunted mummies, haunted objects returning from India and so on, where he was able to give expression to that interest in the more kind of uh, supernatural, spiritual side of things. Um, you know, I think it's a shame in a way that the Gothic stories are overlooked compared to the Sherlock stories, because he was an incredible writer of that genre as well. Shribani, let's get the hero of your story um, into our conversation properly and get him to meet uh, Conan Doyle, George Adalji. Now, we, we know that lots of people wrote to, to Sherlock Holmes asking mm -hmm. for help of, of mm -hmm. one sort or another, occupying a, a strange kind of dream, really. But he wrote to him with a, with a very particular kind of, of plea. Can, can you tell us what that was and why he made it? Right. So... Just, you know, for all those listening who don't know what, what, George, what has happened to George Adalji, I'll just sort of give a brief summary. So in 1903, uh, George lives in this village uh, of Great Worley, which is a, you know, a few miles from Birmingham. He's a 28-year-old solicitor who goes, leads a very ordinary life, goes every day by the 845 train to Birmingham, uh, works in a law firm as a solicitor and comes back home. Uh, he doesn't go to the pub, he doesn't have many friends, he's a bit of a loner, he's a little, you know, odd, uh, as, com you know, as compared to his other friends, uh, other colleagues and peers. Um, his father is uh, a Parsi, um, and so he's an Indian from, um, he's come from Bombay, he's converted to Christianity, and his father is the vicar of Great Worley. So this family, and he's married to an Englishman, George lives with his father. He's 28 year old, but he lives in the vicarage with his father and his two other uh, siblings. And in 1903, um, there is terror in this village because someone is coming out there and slashing cattle. So they're mutilating horses and leaving them to die in the field. And uh, this goes on for six months and the police have no handle on it. They don't know who it is. They can't catch the killer. And the village, as you can understand, they're terrified. And what happens when, you know, some people are living under terror, there's rumors, there's everything, and all suspicion suddenly points towards this, the only Indian family in this village, and they live in the vicarage. And here's George, he's a bit of, you know, he's got no friends, he's a loner, he likes to walk at nights in the countryside, which suddenly become translated into prowling in the dark. You know, you live in the countryside, you walk, but of course, you know, that gets translated into that. And basically, suddenly anonymous letters start and they start accusing George of committing this crime. George, who has nothing to do with animals, has no motive for slashing them, but the police catch him. They arrest him. He's tried. 
He's found guilty. In 55 minutes, the jury decides that this man has done this. He's written letter, anonymous letters and he slashed cattle. And he is, in, he is in prison for seven years. But a campaign starts and in three years, he's released. People realize that this trial is really flawed. The evidence is, you know, isn't up to it. And a lot of legal minds sort of question this and he is released on parole. But of course, he's been struck off the solicitor's roles. He can't practice. He can't even live in Great Worley anymore. He goes to London because he says, suppose the cattle gets slashed, I'll be blamed again. He doesn't know what to do. So he writes to Arthur Conan Doyle. And that's how Arthur Conan Doyle enters this story. He writes to him and he says, you're the only one who can help me. You know, help me clear my name. We need Sherlock Holmes to solve this mystery. <laughs> And so among the pile of letters, apparently um, Arthur Conan Doyle would get about 60 letters at the very least every day. And many of them would be of help, others would be fan mail. Um, his secretary would sort out his mail and leave something that he might find interesting. And he found George's letter interesting, kept it for him at his table. And Arthur Conan Doyle rose to this challenge. So he is quite fascinated by this Parsi family that's been victimized. He feels that a miscarriage of justice has happened and he's going to rise to this occasion and he's going to defend George Adalji. And that's how it all starts. The, the, the story has been has been treated before, hasn't it? Julian Barnes wrote a, a yes, novel in which you yes. heavily featured. I remember a radio play about it mm -hmm. um, uh, mm -hmm. a while ago as well. But you yeah. have so much new material on this and a focus on the whole of the Adalji family and their mm -hmm. earlier history, which puts this story into such uh, sharp and, and brilliant uh, um, uh, context, because mm -hmm. there's before these mutilations begin, there's already a history of this family being besieged, really, yes. in this yes. village, isn't there? You reproduce mm -hmm. all kinds of, of, of mm -hmm. poison pen letters that they, they exactly. Received. So it's it, it all starts when George is just twelve years old. So suddenly the vic, you know the vicarage they start receiving um, these poison pen letters, and uh, they're targeted at the vicar. Um, there's also the usual graffiti painted. The adulties are wicked painted outside their house. Um, there's excreta sort of you know uh, thrown in through the windows. Um, objects left outside, abusive and really you know, really abusive uh, um, letters and uh, quite frightening some of them saying they're going to, you know, you bet $50 that I'm going to send George to his grave. He's just a 12 year old boy. And it's, and if it's sketches, lewd, sometimes bordering on the, you know, completely maniacal um, uh, letters. But um, so this family are besieged and they've got no one to turn to. They go to the police who actually just don't believe them, don't do much and then think that it's George who's been writing these letters to them. And that's the theory the police have, which is why many years later, when there is an actual crime in the village and these letters start appearing, they just say, oh, it's him again. Yeah. I mean, why would George be writing these letters as a 12 year old? There is absolutely no logic in it, uh, but it is just blind prejudice. And it's Arthur Conan Doyle who actually brings these up when he takes up this case, he says, he brings up this history and he says that this, is, this was racial prejudice. This is, uh, this is what happened. This is what happened to the family even before this, these crimes happened. And the fact that these were not brought up at the trial, he says these were absolutely not brought up at the trial. Um, the other thing that's not brought up at the trial is the fact that he is myopic. He's severely myopic, George. He could never have walked in the dark and slashed uh, horses um, on a dark, windy, stormy night, which is typical summer, <laughs> English summer, you know, uh, in August. Um, so these points are brought up by Arthur Conan Doyle. And he, you know, it's thanks to him that all these uh, come up again. The vicarage, you know, he meets Shapurji. He goes to, to the vicarage and he tells him, he shows him these letters and he says how we have been under siege and nobody has helped. Uh, so he really feels that a lot of injustice has happened to this family and he has to help them. Claire, what do you think the, the case reveals about, uh, about the period? Because as it was so, so interesting to, to be made much more aware of all these events that happen 
you know, way before these mutilations uh, begin. And to be, to, to be reading a story that's really about a, a case of kind of, of English rural racism, which I mean, I, I, would, I would venture to say isn't, um, you know, isn't a phenomenon that has been entirely extinguished. Yeah, sadly not. I think what we're looking at here is um, the result of decades of the press and popular fiction creating the idea of the foreigner as other. Um, I think a significant event is the 1857 uprising uh, in India, where we have people as famous and beloved as Charles Dickens, describing Indians as needing to be exterminated. So those kinds of prevailing attitudes were popular and in the press, in the public imagination for decades before that, and I, that it becomes ingrained in to the, to the public imagination then. How many Parsi converts it were there in the Church of England um, in, in positions uh, uh, like this, uh, Shrabani? It seems, you know, it seems a, quite a surprise to find this family here and mm -hmm. this, uh, this vicar with this backstory uh, in course. the Midlands. Yeah, um, well, it's his backstory. Actually, Shapurji himself is what, you know, <laughs> several pages in, in my book. I had to cut him down. There was so much on him. Uh, but because he, the Parsis, basically, they're a very westernized uh, community in India. And they, would, uh, they, they came from Persia. They're followers of Zoroastrianism. Uh, they, they left Persia because of Arab persecution and they came to India. And they settled in Bombay and Karachi um, they were very enterprising, so they became wealthy quite quickly. They uh, and the British worked with them. They could. They found that they could work with them. So um, uh, they 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 have business in tech cotton, textiles, even the opium trade. They ply the ships. Um, and uh, uh, Shapurji is sent to this uh, Elphinstone College, which is a very um, uh, you know it, it's one Fancy. of the elite yeah. yes elite colleges of um, of Bombay. And um, he, well, they thought he would become a lawyer, just like the rest, you know, go mm -hmm. to the bar, etc. But you know, the Parsis were actually sort of targeted by missionaries because they were sort of ripe for conversion. So there is a, a manual for the Parsis, you know, how to convert them, which I found fascinating. Mm -hmm. So I think Shapurji, as a teenager going to Elphinstone College, found many of his peers, Parsi, uh, you know, other students getting converted, and he himself then wants to join. So he runs away from his house in Kolaba. He, he leaves his family and he, he goes to Reverend Wilson and says, um, you know, baptize me. So he is baptized. And of course, he is quite evangelical in, you know, a new convert is always <laughs> sort of more fierce. So he's, he denounces his faith and says, how, you know, how uncivilized it was, etc. And he, he wants to embrace, uh, you know, civilization and Christianity and he, he travels, he, he funds his own way, he writes a dictionary of Gujarati and, and English and he sells it and he funds his travels and he comes here, he wants to train to be a priest. And uh, 10 he's years- He's seen as a bit of a success, missionary success story, isn't yes, he? Yes, he is, mm -hmm. he very much is. And he speaks for them. So he's noticed because his, he gets his curacy in Oxford, in Burford, and he's noticed by you know, the other priests. So he's, he rises quite quickly. And then he marries an English woman who is also the daughter of uh, another vicar. So he's moving in church circles. I think that helps him, you know, <laughs> gives him a leg yes. up in that sense. So yes, because does... reading your account of it, there was no, there's no kind of resistance to this marriage. There's no, yeah. there's no, there's no Romeo and Juliet angle on this, no, is there? No, absolutely. I think they had connections with India as well. And it's also, she's in her thirties. So, you know, the father is quite happy that she's found somebody she loves. <laughs> <laughs> he likes uh, Shapurji, who's a very, you know, he's a gentleman, he's good, he's, he's earnest. And so um, the marriage goes ahead. It's, it's written about and covered in the local press. Uh, and, uh, well, because of her connections, I would say it's definitely uh, his wife's connections that he rises and becomes the first vicar. So he is the Parsi vicar. But interestingly, Matthew, the Parsis have done so well um, that the first Indian MP in the House of Commons mm. 
is a Parsi, Dada Bhai Naroji. In 1892, he becomes the first Indian MP. And the only three Indian MPs uh, who uh, out there before independence were all Parsis. Mm. So Dada Bhai Naroji is succeeded by Mancharji Bhavnagri, who was a Tory. Uh, and then the third MP is uh, Shapurji Sakladwala, who was for the, uh, the Communist Party of Britain. Mm. So these three Parsis represented you know, different political parties, but it just shows how um, educated and politically active they were that they came here, they joined <laughs> politics. And uh, so it's a community that um, is doing very well. It's very uh, westernized as well. And it also, it, it adds to our understanding of the, of the complexity of, of Victorian uh, culture as well. Mm -hmm. Doesn't it? But there is there is a, an institution that is bumped against quite quite brutally um, by uh, this family, and this one seems a kind of uh, ripe one for discussion um, in the light of uh, uh, Dr. Tony Sewell's report that came out uh, a few days before we recorded this discussion. Um, but um, you know that there is a the, the 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 police as an institution in Staffordshire clearly have a problem with this family, don't okay. they? Absolutely. And, um, you know, Arthur Conan Doyle actually writes it uh, that he, he says, um, he says the appearance of a colored clergyman with his half caste son um, in a rude and unrefined parish was sure to have its set of problems. And he, he's put his finger on the spot. This is it. I mean, can you imagine this brown man, <laughs> uh, Shapurji, uh, Shapurji Adalji, speaks English in a sort of broken way with a very pronounced Indian accent mm. uh, with his white wife, three children, and coming to this, um, you know, preaching to a completely white parish. Mm. Uh, so it's bound to have- It's an amazing yeah. picture, isn't it? I mean, there's something- you know, it's, it's A brown wonderful. man spreading the word of Christ yeah. to a, preaching this to a white parish. It's incredible. Uh, so it is going to have its uh, repercussions. I mean, this may not have happened in London. We don't know, but mm. I think it is very, this severity of this uh, crime, the hate letters happened because of it being a little rural enclave, mm. where they have never seen, you know, something like this. Claire, reading about um, about the, the particular officers who seem to mm. have have a problem with the Adalji uh, family, who who Doyle develops this this um, this very combative relationship with, and I wonder whether you could see in that any kind of replay of his the ideas or the, the way that we see the police portrayed in in the Holmes stories where you know they're mm -hmm. always kind of one usually one step behind everybody aren't they Lestrade and Gregson and all of those guys they're really just there to make him look good aren't they they're not they're not malicious but but do you think there's do you think that he is um he's in a way playing out something from from his own fiction yeah I think that's certainly a possibility like you say the, the police in, in the Sherlock Holmes stories are not malign, but they are stupid. They are, you know, at, at least one step behind Sherlock. And, you know, he says that they are limited in their thinking. And I think that in itself comes from the kind of the public perception of the police after its formation mm. in the early 19th century, where policemen were drawn from the working classes and there was this idea that they were not highly educated mm. they were not special people and that really the idea of them having the ability to intrude into the lives of middle class people was kind of an affront which is I think part of Sherlock's appeal in the stories that the people who come to him see him as a social equal as opposed to the police and perhaps an intellectual equal and he has powers of imagination intelligence and discretion that the police simply do not is that happening in the adalji story uh, do you think shabani that, that there's oh. something that, that that george recognized george is is kind of going over the heads of these of you know these kind of um uh, flat-footed policeman to somebody who's more of an intellectual. Absolutely, but in in the in George's case, we have the the sergeant on one side, the illiterate, uh, you know, uh, sort of 
um, the policeman on the on the job in the field, but we also have the police chief, uh, Anson, who is Anson. He's the villain character. of your story, really, isn't he? <laughs> easily because he is an aristocrat so he's the other end of the scale he is an aristocrat he has um, uh, he's the son of the lord of lichfield uh, he has all the trappings of the imperial uh, you know mindset and he dislikes he intensely dislikes i should say uh, the fact that a brown man has come to this parish he calls him the hindu vicar of course, he's not Hindu. Mm. He's not even Parsi. He is Christian. Uh, that's why he's the vicar. Uh, but of course, you know, it's this generic word for all Indians, Hindu. Um, so uh, he says the Hindu vicar, he, he says, why is this Hindu vicar, um, you know, preaching in this parish? He who's barely speaks any English. So he is very, very arrogant. He dislikes this family. And when this illiterate sergeant sort of says, I think it's George who wrote the letters, He's very happy to believe him. He, he is convinced without any evidence uh, that George has been writing those anonymous letters and that George has been slashing the cattle. So it, it doesn't take him very long to immediately say, these are the guys, these are the bad guys. So he's the other end of the scale. And of course, Anson is really interesting because when um, Arthur Gone and Doyle wearing the hat of Sherlock Holmes comes into the picture, he absolutely- This one you mean, yes. <laughs> He absolutely, you know, is on fire. He yeah. is not going to be taught policing by a writer of fiction, crime <laughs> fiction. So this clash that happens, it is amazing because here are two men, both, you know, sort of stalwart figures and they are clashing. They come down to name calling. It is highly entertaining mm. in a way, um, but he's, he's just out to derail uh, Conan Doyle. He wants to make sure that he actually lays false trails for him and things. So it's amazing what he gets up to. It's crazy. It's an, it's an astonishing story. But reading it, I also found myself thinking, you know, and I'll put it in, in this terms. If you were doing your uh, a little, you know, thumbnail Sewell report type <laughs> sketch mm -hmm. on the institution of the clergy in this period <laughs> and, and the police, you know, what would you have to say about them from the point of view of... Uh, you know, their, their tolerance of difference? Well, I don't know why Shapurji never appealed to, uh, you know, the rest of the clergy. When he was being victimized, I don't know why he just, you know, took it. He didn't write to any of the Parsi MPs, for instance, and say, you know, this is what's happening to me, help. Uh, he didn't appeal to the other uh, clergymen, you know, in, in the surrounding areas. He went, to the, he went to the police. He was very straightforward. He went to the police. He told them this is happening. Um, and he went to the press, uh, which was clever. But, you know, both of them weren't listening, really. Mm. The, uh, the police didn't care. They did nothing to help him in the first phase and in the second phase. And um, the press, of course, I mean, they were on overdrive. When, when George is actually arrested, uh, the coverage in the local press, and I have it in my book, it's just, you know, you just think, gosh, this is tabloid media at its worst. Mm the way they describe him as this oriental with dark secrets, with a debased jaw. And it's so obvious that he did the crime. And they say it's because of his faith. And, you know, it's, it's just pinned to this man's faith. He wasn't even a Parsi. The, you know, his father had left it behind. There's nothing. He was such a, you know, he was a brummy boy in that sense. Yeah, yeah. But goodness, he is dark skinned. He is the foreigner in this village. And, you know. Who did it? He did it. <laughs> Claire, can we put that idea into the context of the of the, the popular fiction of the moment at, at which Doyle is pursuing this case? Because this might also be a way of, of thinking about the differences between those early home stories and those late ones. Isn't the isn't the kind of the the cultural context of those later ones um, much more bound up with there are plenty more you know the the, the foreign supervillain. Um, a kind of a kind of um, um, you know oriental mutated version of Professor Moriarty who pops up in in forms like like Fu Manchu is on his way, isn't he? In this in this context and figures like Doctor Nicola, you know these people who really are like supervillains, aren't they? Foreign supervillains. So what's the you know what does that tell us about the world through which these real people are moving? Yeah, I think that's another one of the, the ways in which 
fiction writers tried to fill the gap when Sherlock died is by what on one hand the creation of detectives on the other hand the creation of supervillains like Moriarty who had caused Sherlock's downfall and as you say these these supervillains in uh, late Victorian early Edwardian fiction were incredibly racialized so we have like you say Dr Nicola who is um indeterminately foreign I yeah, don't know. he's like Blofeld or something, isn't he? He's, yeah. he's very, or very just, much like a. We don't know dark, what he is, but he's bad dark, news. Whatever he is, he's bad news. Yeah. Dark-haired man with an evil cat and a laboratory, essentially. Mm. And then we have, as you say, Fu Manchu, who plays into the fears of the yellow peril. So we have all of these fears of the foreign other that coalesce uh, in popular fiction around. The, the, the character of the villain at, at this period, which is bound up with ideas about Britain's kind of declining imperial strength, essentially. When we look back on a, on a, a story like this, uh, Shrabani, we're apt to choose our own heroes and villains. Uh, aren't we? We're, pre, we're, we're, you know, the instinct to, to choose, you know, to choose our representatives in a story like this is really powerful, but can we can we as we come towards the end? Can we try and muddy that up a bit? Can we kind of can we can we try and um, you know find a bit of uh, um, something that's slightly less easy to swallow in a way that that Doyle is a kind of anti-racist crusader in the Edwardian period. It's it's bumpier, isn't it, and chewier than that. Mm -hmm. It is. You know, when we're talking about the foreign uh, villain uh, to pick up on Claire's, actually Doyle himself is guilty of that. Sign of four, we have Tonga, yeah. <laughs> the native native of the Andaman Islands. Goodness, he is like, uh, you know, he's somebody who's killed by Watson because he is he's like the devil himself. So, you know, this is a Jumps foreign... out of a trunk, doesn't he, in the oh, middle of the night. Gosh. And also, it's geographical and, and anthropological nonsense, isn't it? it Tonga it from is the totally. Andaman I mean, he's yes. supposed to be four foot something and you know face like a absolutely hideous so again this is going to Doyle painting this villain it's it's very much you know sort of Indiana Jones <laughs> many years later you know Temple of Doom and you have these uh, characters but I think these came to them it's it's the concept they had you know this the tuggy cult sacrificing to animals it all sort of blended in into everything and you know you you produce these sort of characters um, that uh, were nothing, you know, they were just villains, they were foreign villains and you could mm. identify them as such. Um, so I think in a way, Conan Doyle himself was guilty of doing that uh, in some of his uh, books. But the reason he, he chose to fight for George is because also because he is part of the establishment, because they believed that the empire rested on, it was good, it rested on sound principles of democracy and justice and law and, you know, um, so these things had to be, you know, this is what made them great. And if these were questioned and these were sliding, he had to support this. This is a miscarriage of justice. And so he has to, uh, you know, he has to back this. And in a sense, he is backing it because he is part of empire, because, you know, they feel that this is the good that has to happen. And he, he sort of compares it very interestingly with the Dreyfus affair in France. Mm. And he says where a Jewish soldier is accused just because he's a Jew of selling secrets. And Britain at that time is very um, uh, horrified at the anti-Semitism shown in France. So he says, you know, this horror for, for this incident happening in France is not reflected here. Here we are doing it to one of our people. Mm -hmm. He says that happened to a Jew, this is happening to a Parsi. And he puts it really clearly. So I think it is this, you know, this sense of justice that is also very much part of being part of the empire is, is what's driving him. Uh, and that's, uh, it becomes obsessive for him, quite obsessive when you see, you know, how he gets into the case. <laughs> as, we, as we come towards the end, I wouldn't work with, we couldn't conclude just by thinking a bit about how, in a way, Sherlock Holmes and through him Doyle always attends us, doesn't he? he? He's never gone away. And there has never been a moment when Holmes feels alien to our values. You know, whatever those values are at whatever mm -hmm. moment, mm -hmm. he always mysteriously seems to be 
a representative of them. He he's always in a way mm -hmm. a contemporary figure, isn't he? And I wonder why you think Claire, why do you think why do you think that is? Why has why does he why have we never felt at odds with this man? Mm -hmm. Well, he's he's somebody you can you can see now. You know, he's troubled, <laughs> he's brooding, he's often depressed, he's doing drugs. <laughs> yeah, um, it's it's he's almost somebody people can identify with. You know, he is not somebody who's a saint. He's somebody who's troubled. He's very humane in that way, mm -hmm. and he is um, like he's got all all the faults that anybody can have, and at the same time, he has a sense of purpose he has a sense of good and bad and he's going to he has a good heart and he's going to do what you know what he can do and of course he has a big ego <laughs> but, uh, so we can relate to that he's he's somebody you do love you know you you can see why Watson would be annoyed with him but that is part of the charm you you, you know he's somebody you relate to <laughs> what what do you think uh, Claire maybe you get maybe you get the last uh, word here but um, <laughs> why do you think why do you think this character has never, we've never fallen out with him. Uh, we can always find ourselves in him, you know, whether or not, you know, whether it's the, the war period and Basil Rathbone is, is fighting the Nazis, um, whether it's the, you know, the more recent term um, uh, Sherlock series where he seems to be effortlessly part of the contemporary world. Um, and yet he also seems essentially Victorian and essentially Edwardian. You know, why, how can he do this, Claire? It's the six million dollar question, isn't it? I think Shabani is is right. He's an anti-hero. He straddles those boundaries between good and bad, hero and anti-hero, in a way that is appealing. We don't want our heroes to be perfect and you know without flaws. And because he has those kind of mixture of good and bad qualities we're never quite sure if he's definitely going to do the right thing or if he might just do something to please himself he's endlessly adaptable as you say you know i think who your sherlock is depends on your generation is it basil rathbone is it jeremy brett is it benedict cumberbatch is it johnny lee miller the the possibilities are endless in much the same way as they are with the character like dracula or frankenstein the, they're just something that lends itself to adaptation. It has an X factor that allows that. And isn't that wonderful? It is. It is. And this has been wonderful too. Thank you so much, Claire Clark and, and Shrabani Basu. And I should hold, hold this up again, shouldn't I? The Mystery of the Parsi Lawyer. Absolutely riveting um, book. And I'm going to uh, now put back on uh, The Deer Stalker. <laughs> and hand back over to Rebecca. <laughs> Perfect, thank you, Matthew. <laughs> thank you to you, our audience, for joining us today. And a special thanks to today's panelists as well. Please do remember to send feedback if you can, and also check out the British Library's What's On pages to see what other events are coming up. Please also check out HistFest's website as well, www.histfest.org. Thank you. <laughs>